right. Yep. I think I'm about good. Awesome. Uh, great. So, um, yeah, just to, I guess I'll introduce myself real quickly, but yeah, my name's Nirav, like I said, um, I'm with, uh, I, I do freelance work, but um, mostly with uh, a techraptor.net uh, and uh, gameluster.com is where I'm mostly at. But uh, yeah, I just, um, I, I actually stumbled onto your uh, game, I think during the, um, I don't remember was it, if it was part of the Steam Festival or something like that. Yes, um, yeah, there was. Oh, wait, um, it, there was a Xbox Festival. That that was it. It was the Xbox. It was that it? Yeah. Sorry, we yes. were going to be part of the Steam Festival. But we delayed that. I I was convinced for a minute there I was part of the Steam Festival. <laughs> yeah. No. No problem. Um. Yeah. I, I think I stumbled onto the game there and uh, was was kind of interested at the uh, just at the concept of it and decided to give the the demo a run and uh, I. I went on uh, discord after i was done was like trying to tell everyone like oh my god guys check this out this is crazy and uh so <laughs> really cool. really excited no, great so, sounds sounds good that sounds like a good reaction so yeah all right um great so yeah i guess we can go ahead and uh, and get started but um yeah so my, my first question would be like how did your uh how did you guys get started when did your when did your studio come together um yeah, the, the studio is essentially based around starting this project. I mean, I've loosely had a studio with the name Falling Squirrel for a few years before this. But um, in Canada, you incorporate around projects for certain grants. And that's how why we sort of did that. I, I was, outside of that, I've been working with them. Um, I stand, still work with uh, other studios making indie games. So this is our studio's first project. And oh my gosh, Jamie, is it is it four years ago now when we started this? Uh, we would have started this about five years ago. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. Wow. So about five years ago, uh, I, I took an idea that was, was really about uh, finding an inexpensive way to, uh, play with narrative. Um, and I thought, oh, I'll make a game without visuals. Uh, I've experience with, uh, working with actors for voice overs and things like that. Um, and I thought, uh, um, this would be just a good vehicle for, for advancing sort of ideas I have cheaply. Uh, and then within a few months of, of this idea, I realized, oh, this would probably be something that might be interested or interesting to the blind uh, community. So I met up with the uh, uh, people at the CNIB, uh, a person who was working there at the time, uh, Martin Grossels, uh, was uh, the person that they set me up with. And uh, he helped me set up some focus testing groups and things for very early prototypes of the game. And um, the majority of the testing's actually been in the uh, visually impaired community. Um, and, uh, that's sort of ever from that moment on, uh, I was very much, uh, wanting this to be a game that this community, uh, would appreciate. Um, but uh, from the very beginning, uh, the novelty of the experience has also meant that people in the sighted community seem to be pretty interested in the project as well. Um, but it's been a process, I guess, five years, apparently, <laughs> Uh, of uh, getting grants, uh, getting some money from um, Xbox to port to the Xbox One as well. And uh, we've just sort of been steadily working on this uh, amongst other things um, uh, at our company. Yeah, wow. that's that's actually jumps ahead to one of my uh, other questions, which was, you know, what was your what was your relationship working with the the visually impaired community during this process? So it sounds like they've had a, a good bit of input and uh, testing in there too. Yeah, it's funny. I was just recently listening to another developer's experience working with the blind community, and they said exactly the same things I've been saying. Uh, it's it's a very welcoming community. Uh, it's virtually troll free. Um, the main site that we uh, we sort of uh, contribute to their forum is on uh, AudioGames.net. I got that right, Jamie. You got Correct. that right. <laughs> yeah, and actually, do you want to talk a little bit about the, that community there? Yeah, um, just to piggyback off what with what Dave was saying, uh, yeah, we realized pretty quickly that there was um, a niche that wasn't being filled as much as it could be uh, for games. And with the blind low vision community, there is this almost fervent um, community that wants to play um, anything that's available or accessible so being able to make this game um and have yeah the the overwhelming support of this community is really great there's always people who are just willing to be encouraging or supportive but uh additionally we get a lot of feedback that um we wouldn't uh generate ourselves or we wouldn't generate from testing internally um 
yeah, and that can be about gameplay or the narrative as a whole. I think one of the most interesting things that came out of at least the writing was going back and forth um, with regards to making a are the protagonist um, blind and how that can be considered a trope in fiction and how to kind of avoid the pitfalls of that. I sound like I've written part of this now. I haven't. That's still Dave. Um, but it was a really unique part of interacting with that community and, um, you know, understanding that that we come from, uh, you know, we're we're not in the blind and low vision community and we're trying to be aware of, uh, you know, the privilege that we have or the differences between communities or the things that we may otherwise be ignorant of. And um, yeah, the community is really great at, uh, you know, answering uh, any questions or pointing things out that we wouldn't know. It's also a very diverse community. So I haven't, it, it's um, in making a game for a diverse community. Uh, it's also helped broaden, I think the appeal of the game in general. Uh, because uh, it needs to be playable by someone who's maybe never held a controller before or um, oh, yeah. potentially never thought video games were something for them. Sure. And then there's a, a very hardcore element in this community as well. People that speed run, I don't know, uh, Zelda games and things and, yeah. uh, and play Street Fighter. Uh, so, uh, and I, I think we've done a decent job of straddling that. Um, it's not my favorite thing to be trying to do with a game, go so broad uh, and consider so many different opinions. Um, but uh, I don't know. I, I think it ultimately makes it uh, a, a better game in, in maybe a rare case. Sometimes you end up watering things down, but I, I feel like um, having difficulty settings and things like that really allowed us to make a very, very hard, hard mode. Um, one that apparently there's some, some people just do not think is, is hard enough still. Um, I, I can't play it, but um, there's still people that, oh no, I can, I, I beat it. You gotta, you gotta make it harder. Right, and then right. there's a, there's sort of a story only type mode that allows you to just sort of enjoy the story and, and have some relatively passive gameplay in, in terms of combat and stuff. Yeah. Not to ramble too long here. Um, but uh, yeah, Dave makes a, a good point in that having to engage the blind and low vision community, um, you know, there are those people online who are, are really enthusiastic, but all the same in the testing that we did with the CNIB, there's just as many people who haven't picked up or consider a video game controller or considered playing video games uh, um, uh, previously in their life. So trying to make an experience that uh, is accessible both from a uh, I guess like mechanical standpoint, but also accessible from an experiential standpoint has uh, been a interesting challenge. Mm -hmm. Wow, yeah, I, I definitely hadn't considered that part, but you're you're totally right about people probably never having assumed they would ever play a video game. Um, so wow, yeah. Um, so I, I was curious, are there were there any other games that maybe gave you inspiration for this, or that you you feel like you might be building on the back of? Because I, I haven't seen a lot of other stuff like what you're putting together here. Yeah, actually, um, I'll, Jamie, I'll let you field that because you did a lot of research initially on uh, what games were out there. In, I, in the yeah, um, so I definitely think there is a lot of inspiration. Probably the most similar game that we get compared to is uh, Blind Legend. Um, sorry, I've got a dog in the background here who's become right. very excited. Um, and uh, yeah, so when, when uh, we were doing market analysis and we were looking at other uh, audio games or... Um, there were a lot of games that either, you know, lacked uh, production value or lacked, uh, you know, the experience of um, professional developers. Uh, so you had really neat tech demos or really popular games that um, were, weren't were necessarily the most uh, competitive in terms of being uh, on the market, but were still really popular and well received. So when we set out to make The Veil, we wanted to make an experience that would be uh, equitable to a, a, a AAA experience um, or a, a, I guess a AAA indie experience. Yeah, sure. Um, that um, would still be accessible. So, um, you know, Blind Legend is probably fairly similar mechanically. Uh, I'd like to think that our, our uh, the veil has uh, done a really good job at uh, getting really uh, talented voice actors, audio designers. Um, the music in the game is good, uh, and. Uh, yeah, we've, we've tried to yeah. make a quality experience where we find that there aren't as many, but definitely, yeah, Blind Legend is very similar um, and probably a, a big 
uh, I guess inspiration. It kind of turned out that a lot of the things that we thought of uh, were already present there. I don't want it to seem like, oh, we played this game and we want to make the same game, but a little different. Sure, um, sure. But yeah. yeah it's, it's amazing how when you start to develop something, you start realizing why people made the decisions that have gone before you. So we had actually made a lot of design decisions in early production and then saw the same things in other games. And we're like, well, we know why they did that, um, yeah. whether it's a limitation or, or some opportunity that we, we both saw. Right. This is a, a bit of a side question, but I, I remember reading, a, this must have been years ago, but I remember reading an article that the game 1-2 Switch had become quite popular with the blind community because you can actually play the entire thing without looking at a screen. I don't know if you all have heard anything about that. I did not come across that. That that tracks. I mean, I totally get it. Um I, I I had made that connection early because one of um uh, my friends, one of the consultants who's blind on the project, had tried that out, um, and actually very early on, um, we had uh, thought of going to the switch, uh, because of the uh, tactile. I don't know what they called it actually, but the uh, the motion think, controls. Well, I guess mo or... the motion controls where there's. I mean, now Sony's hit that out of the park too with that that sure. amazing, uh, the, the tactile feel or the haptic right, feedback right. The in the shot, controller. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, I, I'm kind of glad we didn't push that because we're doing so many things as a small company that um, trying to do that really well on top of getting the audio right and stuff might be a, a, a bit excessive, but I um, I do have an interest of coming back to those controllers and then maybe the the PS5 controller as well and and, and thinking of, gosh, what can we do with that as, as yeah. another layer to the experience? There is haptic feedback that is important, or not important, but is it really enhances certain elements of gameplay. Uh, but at the same time, it's it's fairly straightforward the way we're using it. Um, so maybe there'll be a version of this game or a follow-up that'll, that'll really uh, dig deeper into that avenue for, um, uh, uh, for feedback. Sure. Um, so I, I guess maybe to ba back up a second, do you... Did, when y'all got together and started doing sort of sort of game development work, was was there any sort of a hint of an idea of like we want to make a game that the blind community can play the same way as the sighted community, or was that just something that developed out of like looking at what you wanted to do? Uh, I mean, very early on, it, it was about uh, it, as I said, it was sort of a, an efficient way to to play with uh, a narrative based game. Uh, but as soon as we thought of um, making this accessible. Uh, at the same time, wanting to advance the novelty of it, uh, we uh, really started uh, thinking about the analogous uh, connections, analogous, sorry, analogous um, uh, elements of audio play that uh, that are connected to um, what we take for granted in visual visual gameplay, like tells um, that sort of set up timing for for. Um, blocks and and counterattacks, that kind of thing, in, in let's right. say combat, um, and then what's exploration um, in those spaces? And I felt like we were able to sort of identify um, a audio version of most of the things people end up caring about when it comes to interaction or interactivity. Um, and I'm probably the best example of something that we realized um, uh, couldn't. That uh, shouldn't be um, exactly the way you see it in, in, a, in a visual experience is if you have an open area of exploration, uh, there's probably not a lot of enjoyment or value in navigating uh, a maze, for example. Um, so bumping into walls and, and things like that. Um, so we left most of the explorable areas open and we move the um, what the player is sort of trying to do or concentrate on. We move that into the details, listening for details in the space rather than um, navigating uh, a space that's uh, where you're moving around objects. So if you have like a 360 degree uh, audio space, there's beacons in the space that you can hear for important things that are um, likely aligned to um, like the major goals of the game, like getting to a blacksmith shop or getting to a ferry boat or something to go to the next area. Uh, but then there's all these little subtle hidden things that um, sort of uh, allow for emergent gameplay and moments. Um, and even combat's sort of similar in that you're listening for details in the tells, uh, not necessarily um, uh, bigger events. Um, so it, it sort of forces you to listen more carefully. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this, but I, I felt like I was going a good path here. I got you. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, the um, it, it wasn't something that we immediately set out to do with regards to it being um, inclusive like that. But when we started looking at um, how we would go about designing a game uh, and designing a narrative that you couldn't utilize visuals for, um, it fell into place really organically that the more we started generating ideas or looking for other sources for ideas, the more we came across uh, these games and this community and, and realized we could make something um, that hopefully would be appreciated as um, quality uh, and novel. Uh, yeah, yeah, so when Dave mentions, uh, you know, that there are things that are without uh, tells in a all audio space that you're not used to. Um, there are a lot of games that exist now as audio games that have uh, like a AI generated robot voice directing you where to go in a game space, uh, or you go through a menu, um, let's say like you're buying weapons or armor, and it's the same kind of thing where something generically reads you out all the options. But when Dave wanted to make an experience that focused on narrative aspects of gameplay and was um, emergent in that sense. Um, you know, we decided to try to eschew those options and make something that was uh, emergent both in the narrative and the gameplay. So you listen to where the sound of uh, the blacksmith's anvil is coming from, navigate to that space and have a conversation with the blacksmith about the wares that he has and if you're interested in them as opposed to just going through a menu and having to go and uh, I guess develop um, a game like that it just naturally from one day to the next fit, in the pl fit into the place of oh, yeah this is why we're making this this is who we should do it for and this is why it's going to be unique and worthwhile yeah yeah thank you Jamie good Absolutely. save no, that, <laughs> teamwork that, that right. yeah yeah uh, that definitely answered my, my question there um so one other thing I was I was curious about was um, if you were um, I, I guess if you were gonna pitch this because uh, I, I know y'all are very focused on this the the narrative and like from the demo that I played I was also very intrigued especially you know the the protagonist and her struggles and everything like uh, if if I were if somebody's reading this or, or listening to this and doesn't know anything about this would, what was your like brief pitch for what this narrative is about. Yeah, it, it basically follows the um, a, a journey um, of a second-born uh, princess, or I guess a second heir, a second in place to the throne, uh, a woman, a young woman who's been uh, basically exiled to the boonies by her father. Uh, his dying wish was to basically have her set up to lord over a castle somewhere in the outskirts, and she feels that this was. Uh, connected to her blindness that he's just um, never really had an imagination for how a, um, a blind uh, person could be become uh, an advisor or a leader. So she gets ushered out in, into the barrens and uh, her caravans attacked um, on the way out there. Um, and she ends up having to make the journey home. It's about 500 miles. Um, so she basically use her, uses her wits. Her uncle had been training her to, uh, with, uh, with a sword and shield so she's an able combatant um but she basically has to um uh, find allies um and uh uh to to make this arduous journey home and then on on the way there she she learns secrets about her own family and uh uh and just sort of basically develops a, a legacy and her own um what is it her own um uh uh she's basically cutting out her own place as a leader in the world okay um, yeah no, that's that sounds great. Like I, I, and I have to say that the, um, the the um the voice actor for your protagonist was also she did a great job from what I've heard so far. Um, oh yeah, no, she's she's great. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. So one one thing I think that might be interesting for um that might be on in the back of people's minds when they see something like this, they see a game with, um, just a black screen with no visuals, like. I feel like people may think off the cuff that like, oh, this is like a lot less difficult to develop than games with like actual art and stuff. Like, uh, have you found that? I'm guessing you haven't found that to be true. Well, um, to, to some extent, yeah. Uh, but uh, there is a lot to, to be said about the freedom that uh, removing the visuals has in, in terms of the production process. If, if I want to uh, take the story in, take the story in a different direction, let's say, 
um, have the protagonist uh, at a, a, a desert uh, scenario or a, a different type of environment. Um, that's that's just a, a, another sound package uh, that I can bring in and put together. Uh, most of the work has gone into, again, making these, uh, making a system that uh, makes combat playable and feel uh, it's similar to a visual experience. Uh, that's where the work is and the challenge is. Uh, but in terms of building environments, um, in terms of um, also uh, immersing the player, um, suspending a player's disbelief, it's hugely powerful to remove visuals, especially for um, an indie studio. Uh, nobody's uh, looking at the hair uh, uh, tech or the how how well the facial animation is matching the voice. You, you believe that there's a real person whispering in your ear. It's in binaural audio too, so it's it, it's even a I'd argue an enhanced experience. Yeah. Uh, people feel like they're there, and it it's uh, technologically it's it's um it's not that expensive. I'd actually push. I would love to push more developers into considering people who wanted to do immersive narrative experiences to try this um, because it's incredibly freeing. Um, and uh, and then once you kind of get you know your thing, like you get exploration down or you get combat mechanics down. I feel like the the world building stuff is actually quite easy. Yeah, that's. Yeah. Um, I think. Sorry, go ahead. Oh no, no, go ahead, please. I think there's a there's a, another side to it as well. Definitely not as significant, but the there are a few small hurdles you run into with regards to like you know if people want to stream your game and people streamed uh, the demos that we've had. Um, you know, what is that going to look like? We have particle effects that uh, are in the game just as a passive visual set piece. It doesn't affect the gameplay. Um, and that looks, well, it looks like particle effects. Um, so there's something there. Uh, but yeah, we've run into surprising, I don't, I don't even think it qualifies as like a hiccup or a road bump, just things that have come up where we've said, oh yeah, I guess we need a trailer of our game that doesn't have any visuals let's figure that out or yeah. well, what's it gonna look like when somebody streams this game we don't want it to just be a thumbnail of a of a black screen necessarily but uh so it's sure, been yeah. there's been some interesting parts too yeah and there will be challenges with promoting it too um we had art i had art made for the for the game and the, and the the screen mainly for the fact that i'm like i i needed something but i did at, at one point um consider never showing an image of the main character uh, to allow you to imagine a person of of uh, that looked like pretty much anything, at least a, a young woman, anyway. Yeah. Um, and uh, and I I stepped back from that only because I I felt like we would need something. Uh, to me, it's sort of akin to you know, fantasy fantasy novels needing like a a painted uh, picture in the front, which I I bet most uh, novelists hate that part. They they really <laughs> don't. They do not want to have anybody imagining their characters for them outside of the 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 um audience which is something that's afforded by the the lack of visuals too people can imagine sure. alex or, or the main characters to to look and and be quite different if they they choose to yeah that's that's really cool um with all the work on on sound that you guys are doing i was curious if one or both of you have a, a background more in, in sound engineering than in game dev um i do now <laughs> <laughs> five years of this no other than um than being a voice uh uh uh, when I saying director of voice, voice actor, director uh, in AAA. Um, so I have some experience with working with actors uh, and live action, by the way, as well. Uh, okay. So that I felt very comfortable with. And I also felt that that was the most important bar uh, to hit uh, was getting convincing acting. Uh, but the rest has been uh, a learning journey. I do have consultants though. I have a sound engineer who does the recording of the audio who gives me a ton of feedback on just the mixing. Um, and I've uh, reached out to experts and friends who, who know the, the tools and things. So I've been doing, I'm doing most of the work, but I'm certainly not, not doing most of the thinking on how it should be. I, I really relying on people much with way more experience than I have uh, to help me through this. Um, yeah. One, oh, sorry. No, no, that's okay. Um, oh, I, I also was going to ask, like, one, one thing I always enjoy seeing in, in behind the scenes videos of, of different uh, games, especially, is the kind of wacky stuff they have to do to get the sound that they're looking for, like, to record. I was curious if y'all have any funny stories about, like, something you had to, like, I don't know, some weird stuff you had to do to get the right sound that you were looking for for something. 
No, we we're not. We don't do a ton of foley, other than I I recorded my own dog. Um, the, the <laughs> dog, the dog in the game is is mostly my dog. Uh, and again, it, I apologize for not being funny, but it's to me it was amazing. It was like magic. Is I had two actors, um, two actors who uh, I hired are from the blind community, um, and I hadn't considered how how do you record audio um, with uh, somebody who's visually impaired and. Uh, uh, one thing uh, I, I assumed that there would be memorization involved or I didn't know, maybe there's a Braille reader because um, there, there's some in the community who can who can real bra uh, read Braille at a speed that, that they can basically do cold reads and material. But it's, that's pretty tough. Um, and two of the actors, um, they their method uh, was to play back the uh, a robot voice audio as they are saying the lines. And as an actor, I, I was I could wow. not imagine how someone could learn to give a performance hearing uh, somebody whispering the lines in their ear, essentially. And uh, uh, both women were absolutely phenomenal um, who who did this. Um, and they both had similar similar methods of, of um, uh, reading to playback. Um, so that was the most astonishing thing, I think. Um, and it was relatively cold reads. They, they both had sort of were familiar with the work, but they hadn't memorized it. So they were they were listening to it as they were reading lines in character. So I was I was really impressed with that. Yeah. So you've actually also sounds like you've also cast some uh, some um, blind people in in the in the game as as characters, correct? Yeah, we we did our best to include the community. I thought that was relatively important. I, I did want to try to cast the main character. Um, in the community, um, it I, I think I set too many limitations on uh, or restrictions in terms of uh, I needed an accent, I needed some very specific sure. things, um, and I I hope I I really hope I can do better next time. I ended up casting the second half of the project. I did end up uh, casting in London because I had so many uh, English actors or English accents needed. Um, so I, I might look to London earlier or to maybe a region, uh, that might have people in the visually impaired community that have the, the accents. Uh, cause I, I really didn't want bad accents in the, in the game. Yeah, um, sure. so it just, just from a representation standpoint or opportunity standpoint, um, there's four actors, I believe from the community in the game, all of them play sighted characters. And uh, of the three blind characters in the game, uh, they're all sighted actors. Um, so, uh, and I just let the chips fall where they where they might um, on that. Uh, but with help from the community con consulting uh, on narrative and stuff, I, I think I hope um, I did a decent job of representing uh, the community on that front. And then also the the racial diversity within the game, uh, although um, people don't necessarily play the specific backgrounds. Like for example, I've uh, an actor, uh, I, I believe, has a Pakistani background, uh, who plays a Scotsman um, for half of it, and then plays someone with a more of a Middle Eastern accent, and the other half of oh. a Syrian Syrian actor that plays a Syrian character, but also plays English characters. Um, so I tried to, I just went where the accents were, but again, the the basic breakdown of the cast is, is pretty reflective of the diversity in the in the world. Um, so that, those are the two things I was, I was attempting to do, uh, in yeah. the casting of the game. No, that's, that's great to hear. Um, so this is maybe, 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 uh, don't have an answer, but like, I, it sounds like you might be pondering what, what are your future plans past, like, you know, whenever you get, whenever the veil is shipped out, like, what are you guys thinking to do next? Is it more in this, this arena or would it be something else entirely more of a traditional game? Well, um, my the company Falling Squirrel Games is again centered around this or Falling Squirrel, I guess, or not Falling Squirrel Games, Falling Squirrel Incorporated. Mm -hmm. That sounds that sounds exciting. Um, basically, we were I, I formed this officially and incorporated for this game. Um, I suspect a, anything I do that's um, very specific to to um, making games for the blind community, I'll probably do under this company. But I I work for two or three other small indie companies as a creative director, and I'm 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 a big part of those companies as well. Um, and one thing I will attempt to do first off is the three projects I'm working on outside of the Vale. Uh, I am trying to bring these around to having uh, accessibility built into at least one or two of them, or yeah. potentially. Um, we're making uh, we're working on or have worked on the past a, a pinball game. A pinball role playing game, um, and oh, uh, wow. <laughs> I, f I feel like I have this crazy thought in my mind that, that I could actually do a, a an all audio pinball game because we have all the mechanical setups in, in the engine and stuff. So right. uh, I have this like thing where I want to kind of try that out for some crazy reason. 
Uh, but I think anything I work on, uh, and there's a lot of narrative driven stuff I end up working on because, because my focus is narrative. Um, so, you know, this, I think is just a first step in thinking about accessibility. Um, and I, I think we will see accessible games come through the other companies I work for, I hope. Uh, and then depending on the success of this game, um, I very likely will try to develop this further. Um, I suppose my, the, the, the crazy dream would be to uh, expand this world into a, a visual based game that could be accessible for the hearing impaired community, uh, which this game is not wow. um, for good, obvious yeah. reasons. Um, and uh, have, and, and really try to even work in the aspect of role playing into um, the play experience with excessive, with a, a disability, I guess, in mind. Uh, the example would be um, if you played as a sighted character in the game, uh, you would have um, support. It would be visual for one, but there would also be accessibility um, support for blind uh, players so they could play a sighted character. That wouldn't be hard. Uh, but at the same time, you could actually choose to play a blind character and potentially have the visuals <laughs> removed from the game to, yeah. to, to really em embody that experience, or at least in certain points of the game where it became the, the novelty could be could resurface on some level. Um, and I, you know, I, I just think that would be an interesting idea. I mean, I don't know how practical it'd be or interesting would be, but ultimately I'd, I'd love to see, uh, make a game that really anybody could play. Uh, and I, you know, as much as I can take in, um, physical disability as well, um, into, into the idea of how, how can I make this game playable by virtually anybody? Yeah. Yeah. When testing the game, um, I think the number one thing that came up again and again from what people wanted to experience was some kind of multiplayer. Uh, so I know for me, I think it would be really cool to work on uh, a game that would be an accessible competitive experience. Yeah. Uh, like okay. my, huh. I used to play a lot of fighting games and I think the first foray I had into the um, blind gaming was uh, a professional or competitive Street Fighter player um, who is able to compete, um, you know, uh, while being visually impaired and being able to have a game that is out of the box accessible and offering a competitive experience would be really, really neat. Uh, and multiplayer in general, I think, would be really exciting. Uh, yeah, so I hope that there is more to come after this because uh, not only are we passionate about it, if our ramblings aren't evident of that, yeah. um, <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of people uh, who are passionate about uh, engaging in experiences like that. So it would be cool to yeah, them. that that's a really great. I had never even conceived of the idea of doing multiplayer like this, but I would be absolutely thrilled to see that work out. Um, that sounds awesome. So uh, are y'all planning on getting, is this sort of slated for a 2021 release at the, at this moment or. That, I, it's funny. I've said this so many times and then, then thought, oh, why did I say that? But I, I mean, this is becoming relatively safe now. Um, the, the current delay um, we had planned on, on uh, bringing this out uh, last year. Mm -hmm. uh, the current delay was uh, mostly based around COVID Sure. Um, I had some voiceover recording, uh, by the way, there, there are all sorts of productions that are, ha, that, uh, worked through COVID in Toronto. I want to acknowledge that they've been doing it safely. And, um, and I, but, uh, I, I had an older, uh, actor on in the cast that I still need to record. And I, I just thought, um, it would be, it would be okay. Um, that, uh, Microsoft was okay with this. I was okay with this. I could use the extra time to, to continue to develop certain aspects of the game as I work on other games. Sure. Um, so we decided to delay until after Toronto. Uh, left lockdown, which happened last week. Um, so we are just setting up uh, s uh, recording studio time uh, for two of my actors that are coming off of features right now. They're actually doing <laughs> to the two actors I hired for the two main characters are now actually quite popular. <laughs> they're in all, all these big shows, which is great. So good for them. And they're so yeah. nice. Uh, by the way, it's Karen Knox is the, is the um, actor that plays the main uh, character, uh, Alex and Samra Salam is uh, the actor that plays the shepherd in the game. Okay. Uh, and they're both doing great. They're killing it. But um, yeah, we're going to be in the studio uh, in a, next over the next three weeks. And then that's pretty much a starter's gun for finishing the game, about a two month release window. So um, by the math, it's like you know, three, or sorry, three weeks, two weeks, three, two months. So it's like, uh, it's something that um, I'm, I'm hoping uh, we'll be looking at like May-ish, but um, 
Uh, I've been wrong about this too many sure. times. <laughs> to I totally anything. understand not wanting to put down a concrete time. I, even uh, 20, like 20, <laughs> saying it's going to happen 2021 is, is like, to me, of course it is. It's like, it, it'll but, happen when the weather is warm is. at some point. I think yeah. that, that's, that's <laughs> yeah. not inaccurate, uh, uh, right? And, yeah. And so uh, this is this is coming to PC and, and uh, Xbox, right? Uh, yes. Correct. Yep. Okay, and you you have possible thoughts about a, a like a, other consoles in the future, but that'd be a, a while away, I assume. I I think so. I mean, uh, the obvious thing is for me is that the the PS five con- five controller would be something I'd love to like as as a separate launch because right. it would have to be. But yeah. yeah, really thinking about that and saying and, and approaching them and saying, look, dude, like they, they're by the way uh just as um well in fact their console itself is arguably more accessible uh than most con well how many consoles are there um but they've 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 taken some major steps in accessibility uh even the last um la- is it last of us my goodness yeah. uh why can't i remember names of things uh last of us 2 was fully blind accessible yeah um yeah. and uh, so they uh and that's a sony exclusive so um yeah that's i i think they would be a partner that would be willing to try this um at the same time they have a controller that i'd like to do something with i think uh and then the switch for for the controller as well and then just bringing it to as many platforms perhaps the most interesting one to a lot of people in the blind community is to get localization in other languages that's pretty much like making an entirely new game because there's so much voice in it but i i know i've i've spoken to a lot of people from in Europe, because uh, the community is pretty tight knit and, and the word gets around and uh, everyone's asking, like, will there be a German version? Um, but so that's that's something else that maybe another okay. place to go. But yeah, I, I thought you were going to say uh, VR there. I think it would be really neat oh, to, to yeah. get a VR yeah, yeah. version of the game, even though well, it would be, as we dubbed it, the uh, most expensive blindfold accessory. Um, <laughs> It uh, yeah, the motion controls and the ability to uh, have motion tracking uh, when you turn your head and to have audio track around that uh, is just stunning for for parts of the game. So. Yeah, we had that up on the Oculus, and it and it is it it is very intuitive to just turn your head a little bit because that's sort of how you localize locate sound. Um, yeah, yeah, is by just tilting your head a bit, and it and it does afford a, an extra build of ability to to know where things are. So uh, just uh, I, I, my other thought, I think, on the on the platforms was I was curious if there was just in terms of accessibility and getting this to as many people as possible. Do you think there's a way to run this on mobile? Oh, yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, the uh, Blind Legend um, uh, okay. was also on mobile. Um, and that uh, the, I'm trying to think of the only reason that was an afterthought is it's there's going to be a little bit of development work and time in in just getting the gesture based combat sort of stuff sure. working on, yeah, on mobile. Absolutely. So. So it's not it, it it certainly isn't a um uh, a technical limitation or anything like that. It, it's a design thing that I got to sure. figure out, um, and I think I just pushed it aside because uh, it's enough work that I, I think I really just want to launch on PC and Xbox and then and then think. Um, but uh, it's it's important potentially for a lot of people in the community, uh, the visually impaired community, who are are quite familiar with mobile devices and mobile gaming. Um, and uh, there's a lot of elements of a, of a PC that that also limit accessibility. Um, certainly like a, a mouse and, and things like that are, are not yeah. everything's through the keyboard. So um, yeah, that's definitely something we, we're going to look at. Okay. Well, yeah, just to, I guess, final question. Is there anything really you'd like for the, the audience to know about this game to, to maybe get them uh, a little more hyped to, to check it out when it does come out? Uh, I'm going to end on this. It may not be the absolute most hype exciting thing, but <laughs> what one thing it's sort of a, a sentimental idea is uh I, someone asked me once, is, is this going to be like a blind simulator for, for sighted people on some level? Like what is the, 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 the draw for mm-hmm. somebody who's sighted? And I, I, it's very specifically not that. Um, when you play this game, um, you're playing a character who can do incredible things. Uh, she can fight in the dark, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, her blindness becomes an element of, of empowerment. So what I want people to experience is, for one... There's an incredible novelty, in my opinion, to how intimate the game feels, people moving close to you, uh, hearing an enemy breathe down your neck. But there's yeah. also an exhilarating feeling being so good at fighting and even just getting around. Like I didn't that's why I didn't want people bumping into stuff in open spaces. This this woman doesn't walk into an open market to find stuff with any kind of trepidation about something bad happening. Um, she does what I could not do and what most 
blind people can do is navigate a public space um, right. without fear. Um, and that that's that's part of the novelty for a sighted player. So that's what I would say is it's that to me is it, it's not to feel what it's to really you can never understand what that would feel like. But I think you can feel empowered by the idea of this of being this character. Yeah, well, that's thank you. That's that's a great answer. I'm I am definitely going to be trying to to sell my my friends and colleagues on checking this out when it when it does drop. So um, I and yeah, I'll, I'll add to that real quickly is that I. I think y'all have just made an interesting narrative that I want to follow, regardless of if it's a, if it's a, you know, a, a no visuals or or with visuals. So, well, thank you. Yeah, no, this is this has been great. Any anytime I can talk about the game and uh, great questions, by the way. So, thank you for, oh, for doing all this. Yeah, yeah. absolutely.